and the passing score. Believe it or not, I can still remember when I was a senior in high school. I was good in math and bad in physics. I would have killed to be able to write my own physics test and fix the passing score. I'd pick the 10 easiest questions and say, you get two out of 10 and you're home, baby. I mean, you get the point, don't you? But the schools can't lose any more money. That's why the teachers and the students and the parents and the principals don't like this law. To keep your federal money, if you give an easy test with a low score, you'll still be teaching to the test. The kids will hate it. And over time, they will learn less. This law does not work. We need a better system for elevating student achievement in America's schools. And Hillary thinks the best thing to do is to have the federal government take some of this money and use it to recruit, train, and place truly qualified new teachers in science, math, foreign languages, and technology because two million of our teachers are going to age out of the system. And then instead of these tests, she believes it would be better, far better, to identify schools that right now are performing at international levels of excellence with representative student bodies by race, by first language, and by income. Find out what they're doing right in elementary, middle, and high schools and pay to put that in every other school in America. That is a positive response that will allow us to become more competitive. Now, that's my case for her. I think she's got the best plan. There's just one other thing that we've got to fix or we'll never get the economy right, health care. We have got to provide affordable health care to all Americans. And most people experience the health care crisis as a crisis of cost. Would you agree with that? But let's do a test. Raise your hand if you know somebody without health insurance. Look around. Look around. Now, this is very important because this is one of the few clear policy differences between the two candidates. And I hope I can persuade you that your cost problem cannot be solved unless you solve the coverage problem of those on whose behalf you raise your hand. There's not a rich country on earth today that doesn't provide affordable health care for all of its people at a price that is $700 billion a year less than we pay for health care. We pay more because we don't insure everybody. And I hope I can persuade you of that. And I'll just give you two examples out of your own experience. First of all, if you ever write any money for a health insurance premium, think of this. Every time you send a check to the insurance company, you are contributing to $50 billion those insurance companies spend every single year to figure out how not to provide health insurance to people. I mean, go figure. You pay insurance premiums to companies that use the money you paid to figure out how not to insure somebody. I'm sorry you've got a pre-existing condition. Uh, or your kids do, or your spouse. or I'm sorry you've got a health insurance policy. It just doesn't cover what you need right now. There are over 3,000 people in here. I am quite sure that there are three to 500 people that that has happened to in this room. I see enough head nodding to tell me that. Now, so that's 50 billion right off the top. Nobody else spends that money. This is worse. Think of this. 30 cents of every hard-earned dollar every American pays for health insurance is totally wasted on paperwork and overhead between the, the doctors and the hospitals and the insurance companies and the employers. 30 cents on the dollar. To give you some comparison, Medicare's paperwork overhead is 3 cents on the dollar, and it costs the people who deal with Medicare about another 3 cents. And McKinsey and Company did a study which said that Americans waste $200 billion a year on paperwork alone they would not spend under any other system because we don't cover everybody. So here's Hillary's alternative. If you like what you have, you can keep it. If you don't like it, you don't have it, or you can't afford it. Then you can buy into the same plan that ensures federal employees and members of Congress and our families. If it's good enough for our family, it should be good enough for your family. And. Here's how it saves money. First of all, it's illegal under this system for anybody to spend anything to keep from insuring everybody. Everyone gets insured. Secondly, 
because we'll all be insured in huge pools, the administrative costs will go way, way down. Now, it doesn't mean one size fits all. For example, if you're young and single and healthy, you only need to buy an inexpensive policy that will protect you and others from your cost if you have a car wreck or you develop an unforeseen illness. If you have little children and you want dental health care, you can get it. If you have mental health issues in your family, you need mental health insurance, you can get that. If your kids are grown but you're not old enough for Medicare and yet you already have a health problem that requires a big medicine bill every month, you can get a supplemental coverage for that. But in any case, it will all be cheaper than anything you could get now because we'll all be in big, big pools with low administrative costs. Then you take the savings and you give it to low-income working people in small businesses trying to help their employees so that nobody but nobody will find this unaffordable because nobody will pay more than a certain fixed low percentage of their income for health care. Now, if you are tired of making excuses why the United States is the only country in the world that can't solve this problem, you ought to vote for Hillary because she's got a plan that will get the job done, that can pass the Congress, that will have support from business and labor and doctors and nurses. And you don't have to take my word for it. The American Nurses Association, I think, had never endorsed anybody in a Democratic primary before. They endorsed her because they said her health care plan was the best by far that any candidate running for president had offered. And it's very interesting. But we got business people for this now who've never endorsed it. The labor unions, bless their heart, have always been for universal coverage on moral grounds. They figured if their families had it, every other family ought to have it. And I honor that. But I saw something six months ago I never thought I'd see. The biggest non-union company in America, which is Walmart, stood on the stage in Washington, D.C. with a bunch of labor union members, the president of Walmart, and came out for universal health coverage. He said, we cannot solve this problem without universal health coverage. Now, why would he do that? First of all, because he's under heat for not improving health care benefits, and he can't afford to do it unless his competitors do. But far more important, if your health care costs keep doubling every seven years, none of you are going to have any money to spend at Walmart. <laughs> this is not rocket science. We can't choke this economy off by paying more and more and more for the same health care. That's very different from medical research. But we can't. And that's the last thing I want to say about this. This country needs to get back in the research business. We have politicized research and underfunded it. Everything from human genome to stem cell research, to research in how to care for people with diabetes and other chronic conditions, we have got to get back in the research business. And I will predict to you that it will be the major source of jobs in the next decade. We've got about 10 years' worth of economic growth that we can generate through changing our energy policy to save the planet for the young people here. But as I look here with all the students, you need to know all of you are students here, there an enormous percentage of you are going to live to be 100 years old an enormous percentage, but you don't want to spend the last 25 years of your life with Alzheimer's. You don't want to spend the last 35 years of your life with Parkinson's. You want to do something to stop this alarming rise in autism among our young children so that it's a huge problem. Or know that there'll be some therapy if your child has it. You want to stop this alarming rise of diabetes among young people, which could create a huge divide where you've got most young people living longer than ever before and more young people with type 2 diabetes, the kind you get from living, not the kind you're born with, than ever before. All these things will be solved by research, and that's very important. So that's my case for her. That's the best economic plan you're going to find. She understands it's the best. And the final thing is she is way the most qualified to stop this home mortgage meltdown that could wreck the whole economy before we ever get off the ground. It's a big, big problem in Indiana. And she's the only person who says, she's the only person who's pointed out that 90% of the people facing mortgage foreclosures have never missed a mortgage payment. Never missed a mortgage payment. They signed these subprime mortgages, paying interest for five years. Nobody told them that the people that gave them the mortgage were going to turn it into stock and people would bid it down and make it worthless. Now they got mortgages that are bigger than their home's worth anymore. And they're told they're going to have to pay even more. Hillary says it's cheaper to stop this now, let these people stay in their homes for five years at the same mortgage rate, than to let two million of our fellow Americans be thrown out on their ear and spend 50 times what it would cost us to stop it, cleaning it up after the